Evolutionists believe in millions of years of history where specific fossils appear at specific places in the fossil column. Well, what about fossil mix-ups? Today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now, on, on this week's program, we're going to talk about out-of-place fossils, fossil mix-ups. That's right. Uh, they do exist, despite <laughs> yeah, notions well, to the contrary. <laughs> yeah, even in the most widely um, uh, publicized modern uh, creation-evolution debate, that would be the one between uh, creationist Ken Ham and uh, evolutionist Bill Nye, yes. the science guy. Yep. Um, Nye dogmatically claimed that... Uh, and actually asked Ham, challenged him to cite any out-of-order fossils in, in the geological uh, record because, because if there were any, of course, this was going to be a big problem for uh, the evolutionary model. And of course, uh, due to the seeming confidence that Nye had when he said this, and, and by the way, it wasn't answered in the debate uh, either, uh, many skeptics have kind of pounced on this and said, well, this is an unanswerable question for creationists. And even our speakers have mentioned that, uh, you know, we get challenged. We're getting that question. We're getting yeah. that, that yeah. question. Uh, at a recent event, our U.S. Uh, CEO, Gary Bates, um, was... Um, well, he actually encountered a Christian university student that basically said that this this question was being used by university lecturers at his, uh, you know, as, as kind of a club to, to beat him with. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it kind of appears that this is kind of like a knockout punch argument that uh, Nye is, is supposedly being used and uh, is supposedly falsifying the creation model. That's right, yeah. Now, the, now the best way to counter this would be to ask whether evolutionists, uh, evolution makes any predictions about the fossil record. Right and then have new discoveries disproven those? Have, have they been contrary to those predictions? First, you have to know what evolution predicts, yep. and uh, then you can know if there's anything out of order. We exactly. should start there. Yeah, exactly. Now, the, the ages assigned to fossils comes from the position in the alleged geologic column, right. and the, the dates assigned to the rock layers in which they were found. So. Remember that it's, it's believed that the rock layers were supposedly to have been slowly deposited over millions, millions of years. years yeah. and, and similarly, the processes of burial and permineralization is also supposed to have taken a long period of time. Yeah, now in reality, there are a lot of fossils that don't fit within this neatly defined evolutionary sequence over millions of years. Right. And, uh, and, and not like the, the, the neatly defined series paraded in our textbooks. Right. Uh, for example, pollen fossils, you know, fossilized pollen. Uh, as evidence of flowering plants, were found in Precambrian strata. Now, according to evolutionists, flowering plants evolved 160 million years ago, but the Precambrian strata is uh, 550 million years old. That's out of place. That's out of place. You can read about that in an article on our website, creation.com slash Rorema pollen. Yes. Now you can see it there on the screen. Now, dinosaurs, uh, according to some evolutionists, yes. are, are supposed to have evolved into birds, right? You've got dinosaurs evolving into birds. But Confucianosaurus was a true beaked bird that predates the feathered dinosaurs that it allegedly came from. And, and it's been found, uh, also been found in the stomach of a dinosaur. So you've actually got a dinosaur that has eaten birds. Right. And uh, you can read about that at uh, creation.com. Well, slash eat birds. Eat birds, <laughs> that's it. Creation.com, eat birds. <laughs> eat birds. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, I mean, really, an evolutionist, all they need to really say about that argument is that Confucianosaurus wasn't the first feathered dinosaur after all, um, because logically, it, it, it doesn't negate the fact that dinosaurs could have evolved from birds, right? You could have yeah. had one line yeah. go here and one there. But, but on the other hand, it, it, there's, there's no really reason to believe that they evolved from, dino, from, from birds if we found them together, right? It's just, a, just an idea. So um, anyway, interesting story there. Yes, yeah. Evolution textbooks have long taught that fossil evidence shows that grasses, grass plants, evolved around 55 million years ago, after the extinction of the dinosaurs, right. which was about 65 million years ago. Woe betide any illustrator <laughs> who drew a picture of dinosaurs and had, had grass in the landscape. Right. No, no, that's a no-no. Yeah. Uh, as one scientist in New Scientist magazine said, he said this, Artist impressions of dinosaurs grazing on grassy plains were considered as bad as depictions of them cavorting with cavemen. <laughs> 
But an examination of fossilized dung has shown that the prehistoric beasts did indeed eat grass. Right. Yeah. Grass has been found in fossilized, it's called coprolite, that's the, that's the polite word, but it's fossilized dinosaur dung. <laughs> and scientists can study that and you, you find out what the animal ate. And grasses are there. Hey, dinosaurs ate grass. Grass exactly. was there when the dinosaurs were there. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, at one time, dinosaurs eating grass was as bad as dinosaurs being depicted with people. Yes. But it's all okay now. Right. right. Because of this new discovery. So yep. why is the idea of dinosaurs and people living together not okay now? I guess we'll need to just find a different haven't discovery. Yet found evidence of that. Right, right, right. We'll see. So. And we'll be back. More fossil mix ups. In 2001, a fossil skull found in Chad electrified the world's scientific community. Nicknamed Tumai, this creature supposedly lived when the human and chimp lineages allegedly split, making it the oldest human ancestor ever found. The leader of the team that made the discovery confessed, It's a lot of emotion to have in my hand the beginning of the human lineage. I have been looking for this for so long, I knew I would one day find it. So it's a large part of my life. But not all scientists accept this conclusion. For instance, Dr. Bridget Sennett of the Natural History Museum in Paris dismissed the skull as a mere female gorilla. With such conflicting opinions about the same skull, it does make you wonder. Perhaps the skull's discoverer let his emotion and desire for discovery obscure his interpretation of the evidence. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, if you just tuned in, we're talking about fossils out of place, fossil mix-up in the geological record. That's right, and dinosaurs, uh, a lot of fossils there. Dinosaurs, and, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter where CMI speakers go, right? We, we, we're practically guaranteed to be asked about how, you know, in a Q&A or something like that, how dinosaurs and the Bible, how we can answer the questions about, about the time sequence, when they existed, yep. did they evolve, yep, yep, all that kind of stuff. So, um, I mean, you see a classic evolutionary portrait of dinosaurs, uh, like the one you'll see on the screen here. It, it usually depicts them in, 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 a, in a forest of uh, you know, exotic plants and, and tropical type things. Right. And, and if you see any other creatures, they're typically you know, uh, other reptilian type creatures. If you, if you yes. do see a mammal, it's usually some shrew-like you know, tiny little mammal or something like that. And I, I grew up with this stuff. It was the, the imagery I grew up with, yep. dinosaurs, yep. Um, gave me this land before time feel. And then of course they typically show you a chart, right, with a geologic col column like we talked about before. Sure. And it would show these supposed, you know, uh, ages in time, and typically you find the, you know, the, the sea life here, and then you find, you know, things growing out of the ocean, and then you finally get dinosaurs, and then you get mammals, and then you get people, and of course people have that in their head that this is a sequence, and we never find any mix-ups, so to speak. Right. Now, uh, that's really not what we find sometimes. So. <laughs> no, uh, ma many still think that mammals and dinosaurs, for example, never coexisted. Yep. That's, you, that's the impression you might get from some of these charts. Or if yep. they did, they only lived with these, like you said, small shrew-like things, little uh, things running around there. But however the facts show otherwise, again, yep. science comes to the rescue of these false ideas. Gradually, more and more evidence is being discovered that is consistent with what we know from the Bible. Right. Science supports the Bible, namely that dinosaurs and, and other, all kinds of other creatures lived and died at the same time. Yeah. Uh, many people's, uh, to many people's surprise, uh, ducks, squirrels, platypus, beaver-like and badger-like creatures have all been found in dinosaur-era rock. Right. Uh, in these layers, along with bees, cockroaches, frogs, pine trees, things like that. Uh, most people don't picture a, a, a T-Rex walking along and, and then a duck flying overhead. <laughs> quack, 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 quack. Well, that's... that's that's what the fossils would suggest. Ducks That's right. And T Rexes are buried together. That's right. And you can find out about that uh, article on our website, creation.com, Dino Age. Right? Now, I actually wrote that article. And, yes. and in the yeah. article, of course, I was quoting uh, information that I sourced from secular sources Nature Magazine, New Scientist, Plus One, Public Library of Science, or National Geographic, or, or, or things like that. So I'm quoting what the evolutionists are saying they've found and, right. and what they're yeah. saying. And so, Interesting, we, you know, of course, we get feedback on different articles we write, and, and the skeptic wrote in, this evolutionist, and he challenged what I'd written in the article. So I thought it'd be a good uh, thing to, to show. So here's, here's the uh, skeptic's um, article, and, then I'll, and, then, I'll, and yeah. then I'll show you my response back. Um, this fellow, Alex C., said that uh, evolutionists have long recognized that mammals and dinosaurs coexisted. 
since they placed the origin of both groups in the late uh, Triassic epoch over 200 million years ago. So this comes as no surprise to anyone. You say that creatures such as ducks, platypus, and squirrels have been proven to have lived alongside dinosaurs. I don't think that's correct. The ducky reference is dubious, and birds experts disagree that it was a member of the Anatid family, some call the fossil identifiable. Gansas is not classified as belonging to any living order of birds, apparently the skull was not found, which means it's not certain that it looked like a duck. Ancient monotreme fossils have been found in the Mesozoic, but they aren't identified as platypuses or any other modern monotreme since the fossils are fragmentary. The squirrel you reference is actually uh, Volatil. Catherium, which is not a squirrel or even a rodent, it belongs to a completely different or a completely extinct order of mammals. And the beaver-like mammal is Costorocata, which is classified as a docodont, a completely extinct order. The badger-like mammal is a Repinomammus, which is a trichodont, with another extinct order of mammals. All these extinct orders are said to have died out tens of millions of years ago and have no modern representatives. So I think it's dishonest to say that it has been proven that dinosaurs walked alongside modern mammals and birds. Hmm. All right. So I answered so uh, Alex back, yeah. yeah, and I said, "Well, look, uh, your statement. This comes as no surprise to anyone. Is absolutely incorrect." And I explained to him, "I have personally experienced hundreds of people in my presentations <laughs> that were blown away, whether they were yeah. evolutionists or creationists. That's the reason why I wrote the article yeah. because it supports the biblical account of a great flood, uh, etc." And then, uh, you know, I, I went through and I, I went through all of his, his things, but I said, "Look." You say that these uh, ducks, platypuses, and things like that haven't lived alongside dinosaurs. I don't think that's correct. And he said, I think it's dishonest to say that. I asked him, I said, can I expect that you'll be contacting National Geographic, Nature Magazine, the BBC, uh, you know. And all of and, these places where you got your information and, for your and, article. And telling them that they're that dishonest they're wrong. Yeah. and wrong because that's where I got the information. Of course, Alex didn't um, no get response. back to me on, yeah. on that one. But anyway. I thought that would be an interesting exercise Wonderful. to go through. And we'll be back. Richard Van Grad and Calvin Smith also host a fast-paced and informal internet-based video program called Genesis Unleashed. These faith-building teaching videos feature responses to news articles, summaries of articles on creation.com, interviews, and answers to some of the most asked questions about the creation evolution issue and the most attacked book of the Bible, Genesis. Visit creation.com's media center to view or subscribe to the latest video content. On this week's episode, we're talking about fossil mix-ups, right? How fossils have been found that are out of place with what the uh, evolutionists say they should be in. And of course, uh, particularly this recent debate uh, between Ken Ham and Bill Nye, the science guy, where he challenged uh, Ken to show him an out-of-sequence fossil, just one, and that if he could do that, that would be a huge challenge to evolution. Well, we've shown plenty already, and I mean, yeah, we're just going through uh, a bit of stuff here, and you can go to our website and just look up out-of-place fossils or something like that on the search engine. You'll find Multiple a lot of... Multiple articles yeah. online. Yeah. And, uh, now think about it. I mean, we, we've shown a whole bunch already. I don't know if Bill Nye is going to see this show or if you can point it out to him if you know him. But would it really change his mind? I mean, we've shown not one. We've shown several. Is it really going to change an evolutionist's mind or somebody that's committed to, to that you know, position? Probably not. Yeah. And, and we'll yeah. actually get to why that is a little later on. Well, I want to think about that. We've already shown several examples, so why wouldn't it change his mind? Et cetera? Right. Well, he's a, he's a media entertainer. He's an actor, and he... he um, he waxed eloquently about uh, the discovery of an alleged sea-to-land transitional fossil. This is fish to tetrapod, an intermediate. Right, what hailed, he considered. Hailed, yeah. What he considered a, a brilliant intermedi intermediate, uh, tiktaalik. And uh, this is, uh, tiktaalik is supposed to have been the missing link between fish and creatures that walked on all fours. And, and, and he spent a long time detailing this particular perfect missing link. And uh, he obviously thought it was a slam dunk for evolution in this case. Yeah. Indeed, Tiktaalik has uh, appeared on the cover of numerous magazines. It's in textbooks and so on. It even has its own theme song and its own website. Uh, now, what Nye seemed completely ignorant of is that fossil footprints that predated Tiktaalik of a creature that walked on land on all fours has been found in Poland. And it, that, those predated Tiktaalik by 18 million years. <laughs> Now, it, it can't be transitional. Tiktaalik can't be a transition if there were already creatures walking on all fours long before Tiktaalik. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. And you can read, read that about 
read more details about that. Creation.com slash finished. Tectalic finished is right. the article there. Uh, now, it's not a transitional form. Yeah, it's interesting because there's been all this hoopla about Tiktaalik and, and uh, you know, Richard Dawkins has, has, has promoted it, et cetera. But Nye's the science guy. Shouldn't he be keeping up on, on science? And, and I mean, this has been debunked. The evolutionary community has admitted, okay, well, if there were creatures walking on land before Tiktaalik, then obviously, uh, you know. Yeah, but, well, the people that have studied it have debunked it and said, okay, this doesn't work. Right. But the general evolutionary community, I, I, I think we'd both say that, uh, no, they're still trumpeting uh, this like it's a this which, major evolutionary find yeah. and proves transition. And it's and so actually on. a huge embarrassment for them when they finally realize, right. um, because of all the fanfare about it, of course. But but there's there's actually a TikTok website still. I looked it up <laughs> just as we were preparing this show. So yeah, you're, you're right in the sense, evolutionists have already debunked this. But this common popular, you know, we already... It's the it's, popular view. That's why the isn't issue. the website gone? Right, yeah. Right? Why haven't they changed their mind? Because it's still convincing people. Um, and, and uh, yeah, the University of, of Chicago actually hopes, hosts that website. And Richard Dawkins, in his book, The Greatest Show on Earth, this is where he was, again, claiming that here's the evidence for evolution. Yeah. He actually said, Tiktaalik is the perfect missing link. Perfect because it almost exactly splits the difference between fish and amphibian, and perfect because it's missing no longer. Well... There you go. So here, here's the gauntlet. Here's the, here's the best evidence of evolution. He throws this out there, puts it in his book. Of course, Jonathan Sarfati wrote the book, yeah. The Greatest Hoax on Earth, and <laughs> he debunked all these Dawkins things. Book. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, but again, there, there's this um, promotion of evolution that's out there. You get, a, you get a piece of evidence, you promote it. It's heavily promoted. In the general public, they go, oh, look, more evidence of evolution. Yeah. Quietly, you, you typically find a year or two after that, evolutionists themselves, ah, oh, well, maybe not. And that goes, but you never see that big fanfare of, hey, right. we've debunked evolution. They so, don't do that part. Yeah, the they public is left with the impression that there's all this great evidence for evolution. Right. Yeah. And that's why typically you'll find many people that come to our presentations at churches or universities or wherever we are, they're often shocked to find out all this mountain of evidence that they thought yeah. bolstered their, their uh, belief in evolution and, and has been blown it's away. It's fairly easy for us to do that. Exactly. Because you just keep in touch with the science. And evolutionary scientists themselves end up coming up with refutations to old evolutionary articles. That's right. We'll have more in just a minute. It's often claimed that evolution is simply change over time. And since change over time can be seen everywhere, then evolution is obviously true. But highly qualified creation scientists say there is much more to it than that. For evolution to have turned particles into people, simple change over time is not enough. A special kind of change is needed, that is, naturally occurring change that adds new genetic instructions. No one has seen this special kind of change happen. Darwin's finches, peppered moths and adapting bacteria are all examples of naturally occurring change, but not one of them shows the addition of new genetic instructions. Not one of them writes any brand new genetic code specifying how to make some new complex feature, such as feathers for lizards, for example. And since codes and programs cannot write themselves, there must have been a designer for all living things. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, this week we're talking about fossil mix-ups, fossils that shouldn't be where they are found in the geologic column. Right, yeah, we can approach this from a little different, a different angle, living fossils. We did a show on this just a little while ago. Uh, these are out of place for evolutionists in a completely different way. Yes. Uh, these are creatures that supposedly died out millions of years ago and then are suddenly found alive and well somewhere in the world. The challenge here, of course, is that we would have expected them to still be uh, in the fossil record for all those supposed millions of years. So we find them in the fossil record and then they supposedly go extinct but they're still living today, but we don't have the fossils in that intervening right. they should have been supposedly there. They millions of years. Yeah, 60 yeah. million years ago, 50 million, 40, but Where are they're, they? not they're, they're not there. there. Yeah. So some of these fossils have even been used as index fossils, right? So right. index fossils are used to date the rocks that they're, they're found in. So evolutionists determine the age of certain rocks, and then they'd find certain fossils within those rocks. And then they would say, well, if you find another rock somewhere, which has a similar fossil to that, so then that, that rock must be the same age as this rock. Same age, yeah. Because these creatures yep. lived at the same time, et cetera. Now, um, for example, the coelacanth, that's probably one of the most famous uh, right. examples yep. that creationists would, would point out. 
supposedly lived 60 million years ago, lived at the time of the dinosaurs, and uh, so they found a coelacanth and a rock. Well, the rock must have been at least 60 million years old, and it was kind of embarrassing when, of course, they found live ones off the coast of Madagascar, and you can go swimming with some of them today, and you can see some of the pictures on your screen. So you can go swimming with a creature that supposedly dates back to the dinosaurs, but it's alive today, but we don't find them in the fossil record except for when evolutionists have said they were 60 million years ago. Yes. Why aren't yes. they found all the way through the fossil record if they, if they lived all through that time? Well, right. the, evol the creationists would say that's because the fossils got laid down at the time of a big flood, not over millions of years. Yes. Right? Yep. Makes sense in the uh, creationist viewpoint. Another example, the Wallamai pine tree. Another famous example. Yep. Um, it's still alive today. It lived at the time of the dinosaurs, given the, stand given the evolutionary, evolutionary dating timeline, of yep. these rocks. Professor Carrick Chambers, director of the Royal Botanical Gardens in Sydney, that's Australia, said that it was like finding a, quote, live dinosaur. <laughs> this is because it's known from fossils classed in so-called Jurassic age around 150 million years ago, but not from fossil rocks in later periods. That's right. You know, everyone watching here should, should have noticed something by now, right? I, if you've been really paying attention, yeah, there are lots of fossil mix-ups in the evolutionary yes. story. They're all over the place. And how come this doesn't seem to be a problem the, the way Bill Nye said it would be? How come, how come every time we show a problem, it isn't a problem? Yeah, yeah. How, how First, that by definition, evolutionists would say that there are no out-of-sequence fossils. There can't and that's be. what Bill Nye said. Uh, there are no. They would claim that the fragmentary nature of the fossil record uh, is such that it, mean, it means we don't have a good idea of the entire fossil uh, column or, or the period in which a fossil belongs in. So if we find a fossil in a stratum that's supposedly 100 million years older than, than the species, using the evolutionary dating for, yeah. for sake of argument, it simply means that it evolved 100 million years earlier than previously thought. Voila, no problem. Yeah, the evolutionary interpretation of the fossil record is so flexible that it can incorporate just about any new data, right. uh, no matter how unexpected. In, in other words, the, the order of the fossils that, that's found according to their standard, the evolutionary view, then it's just incorporated as new evidence to provide a better understanding of evolution. Right. So they, they kind of feed into each other. Um, evolution is assumed and then used to explain the fossils. So no matter what we find, by the very nature of the way that they interpret facts, nothing would falsify evolution anyway. Right. The, the creationists can't find the silver bullet. You're not going to falsify evolution that way because it's historical science. And we've beat that to death so many <laughs> times on this show. But that's the difference between operational and historical science. You can't um, falsify historical science the same way you can falsify uh, right. operational science. Because um, it's, it's actually very similar with the creation model, right? We would say, look, absolutely. when we yeah. look at evidence, it yep. fits what the biblical record says. We can show you how it, how we can interpret it according to our model. It's yes. exactly the same and thing. We understand what we're doing. We're interpreting the, sci the, the, the new discoveries of the day according to the history that by faith we accept. Right. Evolutionists often back away from that. But uh, right. we've got a great book on special. Uh, the Fossil Record. It's a great book about fossils. You can pick that book up. Just go online, creation.com. When you check out, use the code CML. It's Creation Magazine Live. The, the uh, TFR, The Fossil Record. And you get 30% off of that book. It's a great book yep. uh, for students, for adults. A great book on the fossil record. Yep. Talks about some of these things. And talks about some of the fossil mix-ups that we've been going through in it, much more detail. So, yeah. Yeah. And we'll be back in just a moment. Creation Magazine is a 56-page, full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your subscription. Welcome back to Creation Magazine Live. We've been talking about out-of-place fossils on this. The last few minutes here we're going to talk about something that's going on in the news. Uh, current evolutionary, um, I don't even know what to call this, but uh, the title of this article that we've, we've printed off from the website, from, from, from Just printed the off web. here, it is a web article. The web article, yeah. Human face shaped by millions of years of fighting, study finds. So, our faces have been shaped because we've been fighting with each other. Evolution really is an explanation for everything, it's, it's right? For everything. It's a full-fledged explanation for everything. Yeah. So here's, uh, here's a little, here's, here's where we're going here. When humans fight, the face is a vulnerable target.
given that the hand proportions that allow humans to form a buttressed fist appear to have been present in the earliest hominins. Do the faces of early hominids exhibit evidence of increased robusticity and buttressing that would be protective in instances of er interpersonal violence? Specifically, it's hard to read this without laughing, specifically, do the bones of do the bones most susceptible to fracture during fighting, the mandible, uh, zygomatic arch, nasal region, uh, orbit, and max maxilla, exhibit increased robusticity? This is, this is... Uh, yeah, I mean, just, just go on the web, going folks. going on in the news. Okay, go on the web and look up human face <laughs> shaped by millions of years of fighting and read this article. I mean, I, I don't know what, what to say about it. Like, okay, so... When we evolved, our human face is vulnerable to, as, as a target. So we evolved all this, okay. this armor. Okay, okay yep. so that's why your nose sticks out as this really prominent target. Hello, wouldn't our noses have evolved? I mean, this, you get hit in the nose, it's, it's pretty damaging. Yeah. You yeah. got your philtrum. That's incredibly painful if you get hit here. Your <laughs> lips, I mean, you, you, you've got a thin plate all around your face. You got your temple. I mean, let's think of another vulnerable part, especially on males. They're talking about males, our face evolved okay. because of fighting. Where, where's another really vulnerable point on the male anatomy? Can we say that? This is a family a, show. Yeah, I know. No, but okay. let's think about their logic here. Have we evolved any e robust <laughs> armor plating? I mean, I don't know. There, I, okay, we, we do articles like this occasionally. There are... There are there's people laughing in the studio here, but um, we did one last year. What was that on, on, uh, oh, on how pe what people would look like? Yeah, we're going to always, <laughs> we're going to, you know, 200,000 years, we're going to have big zwinky eyes and, and all this kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and it, this is, all of these things are, it, it's sort of, it's kind of like evolution on steroids, right? Is it, right. Let's, let, let's apply this, this nonsensical idea that we evolved from apes over millions of years. That's totally blown out of the water by science anyways, but... Yeah. Uh, let, let's apply that to these weird things, like uh, maybe maybe fighting caused our faces to turn out the way they are. Yeah, but th the thing is, though, w w you read the article, you've got a team of scientists, okay? Now, I don't know wh who they yeah. work for. I don't know who's funding them, <laughs> right? I would imagine that if, I don't know if this, this was in Canada, I don't think it was, I think it was in the States, but this, like public funds get sent to these these places of, of, of knowledge. These researchers, and presumably these, these people are... are they they know, get up every morning like you or I do, and, yeah. right? And they, they go to get, put their stuff on, go to work, and I'm going to study how evolution evolved armor plating. I don't have armor plating on my face. <laughs> like, it's just, it, it, it truly is incredible that this kind of stuff gets passed off as science, and yet many, many people, they'll just fire up their, oh, look at this, you know, and that, that's science. Folks, it's a fairy yeah. tale. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, as as one person said, you know, evolution is is, is a fairy tale for for adults. Yeah, it makes great science fiction. Really yeah. lousy science. Yeah, but uh, anyway, we'll tune in next time, and uh, we'll have some more, hopefully not so elaborate stories for you. <laughs>